So welcome along to the next show that we've got on our landscape photography series. Uh, my name is Stephen. If for any reason you've never listened to an episode before, I can't believe it, but this is going to be the best one ever. I say that every show, but it will be. It'll be fantastic because I'm joined by Chris today. This is Chris Sale. And if you haven't listened to our previous landscape photography uh, podcast, uh, Chris was all chatting about the lifestyle of a landscape photographer. Um, but today's something a little bit different, isn't it, Chris? Yep, absolutely. What we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about how to balance your work life with your photography life. Indeed, because the last episode we were chatting about about your life, your, your lifestyle as a, as a pro landscape photographer. My, my lifestyle now, as it, as it is now, yeah. Indeed, and, and that's it. I mean, it, it's great to get that insight as to what... I say the end goal could be like if you know if so if you're listening now and you're thinking you know i'm very interested in landscape photography and maybe it's something that you would look at in the future going full time but so we've talked a little bit about that stage of kind of where chris is now in his life but we're going to go back in time effectively a little bit to kind of mm-hmm. talk about your transition from the nine to five life uh, to kind of go in pro because i imagine there's a lot of you know, you know nuts and bolts to it you know the mechanics as to how it actually worked and but more so what drove you to kind of uh, to do that so uh, and then I've got a few questions are also about kind of how you fitted in landscape photography alongside your job because I know you just didn't wake up one day and went right I'm going to quit my job tomorrow I'm going to be a landscape photographer there needs to be a, a transition to it really and I'm sure obviously you've been doing landscape photography for many years before you went uh, right. full time so I, I think that there'd be a lot of people that'd be interested in, in such a conversation because, you know, there's, there's a many, many people that are very interested in landscape photography. I think it's, would you say it's probably one of the, one of the most popular areas of photography? I think it's growing in popularity. I really do. I think landscape photography back in the days of film was very, very difficult indeed. But with the you know evolution and digital technology, I think it's become a, uh, much more accessible to people and mm. and therefore has grown in popularity yeah 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 definitely i think you know from i mean this is maybe just looking online so it's maybe a bit of a generalization but looking across instagram feeds etc there's there's a lot more landscape photography than i would say uh, kind of product photography or street photography etc maybe i'm not looking necessarily in the right place and i follow more specifically landscape people but it certainly seems to be the case and i think now that we're starting to come out of this kind of covid infected world or at least starting to kind of adapt and deal with it a lot more people are just wanting to get out because they have been trapped or, you know, yeah the feeling of being trapped for so long haven't they yeah absolutely and then i think one of the one of the one of the beauties of, of, of landscape photography or, or nature photography or whatever you want to call it is it, it really does encourage you to get out and see the world and and not just see the world but but make the effort to go and see it when it's looking its absolute best be that the time of day or the time of year and it does encourage you and it does get you out and of course we all know you know we all know the kind of um, psychological benefits of of being out in the in the open air and 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 you know being out in the landscape. Mm, indeed, yeah, yeah, and I and I think you know that there's um there is a good, as you say, it's like a uh, it's a cathartic experience somewhat really as well. I think it's just it's good for the soul as well as you know physically walking around. It's good mm. kind of for your health etc as well. But just okay. to breathe in that air as you were saying, I think you know, having a camera with you alongside is a nice benefit to it as well but um, yeah absolutely when i was before i became a full-time photographer i had a very um busy uh at times stressful corporate job and i found that photography was the only time i ever really switched off my mind from work if I, I would, even if i was at home and sitting down having dinner with my wife my mind would always be racing about work problems and how i'm going to solve this and it was always in the back of my mind and i found that getting out into the landscape and taking my camera and and taking photographs was the only time i was wholly absorbed in something else to the point where those thoughts were, were switched off and in that in that kind uh, in that way it was almost like meditation for me yeah yeah, I, I could I could see a lot of people would see it as, you know, I say a religion, but you know, a a, a practice of good mental health and, and good well being, really. But Absolutely. With with what you were saying about you know how how you how it kind of 
it gave you that distraction effectively from your life. You know, for, for those that hadn't listened to our kind of previous episode, where you gave, I think you gave us a, like a little bit of a bio already, mm. but um, go into it in a little bit more detail. But if we start off with a, a little bit of a backstory, really, as to what you were doing before you went full time in landscape photography, what was that? Yeah, so I, I'd uh, been in IT. Uh, I was, um, I started off as a as a computer programmer, and I eventually became a performance engineer. And I, I'd been in IT for about 20 years when I moved over into um, to being a professional landscape photographer. And my last job, which I was, I was there for nine years, um, I worked for Sky Television, I worked for Sky TV, which are a big uh, UK, um, they're a satellite broadcasting company uh, here in the UK. They're actually the, the largest media company in Europe. Oh, wow. And they're, they're absolutely fantastic company to work for. And I was um, a principal engineer the sky i remained in technology and i worked uh, for the platform engineering department so principal engineers are typically the most senior technical people within an it organization so um i was one of the most senior techies uh, in the company and of course there's then of course the management structure but as, as an engineer with no responsibility for managing people um, I was as, as senior as, you, as I could get. So I spent an awful lot of time doing things like research and development, um, looking at where we needed to go from a technology point of view into the future, but also an awful lot of problem solving. Um, you know, Sky is a fabulous organisation and I love my time there. They're very quick to move, they're very quick to react to changes in the market. And with that come issues in the technology stack um, and a lot of the time, my job as, as a principal engineer for the platform engineering department was about how do we monitor what's going on in the system? How do we find the problems? How do we react more quickly to the problems? How do we get alerted to the fact that there are problems? That sort of thing. So, you know, it was um, an absolutely fabulous job and I absolutely loved it. But yeah, there were times when it could become a little bit stressful. Yeah, I, well, I imagine. I mean, uh, I appreciate um with well any kind of job necessarily it doesn't have to be kind of corporate or engineering that right. after a while there is always demands that you know people want more and more from you expectations get greater and greater and did it just get to a point that i appreciate obviously you've, you've been a landscape photographer for a number of years doing it more so as a as a hobby as a as a, as a mm -hmm. side thing did it just get to the point one day you're thinking right this this has just got to change for me now I, I just I can't handle it or was there a particular moment that you thought right that I need to think maybe more about landscape photography as a job no not not really I and mean, what happened for me was that I had um when once I'd reached the the level of principal engineer I was less being told what to do and I was making the decisions about what needed to happen myself uh, to a certain extent um, and I delivered two or three significantly big pieces of work that had made a significant difference to the bit of sky that I was working in and stuff that I'm still very, very proud of today. And I found myself in a position where I had been in IT for 20 years. I was, come, I was just shy of my 20 year anniversary. Um, you know, I was getting on a bit. So at the time I were in, was in my mid forties, I'm still just in my mid forties. <laughs> um, but it, IT, you know, at a, at a technical level to a certain extent, it's always changing. Um, uh, there's always something new. And, and, you know, in some respects, it can be sometimes a little bit of a young man's game. And there were also times when in, in, in technology, there's lots of evolution and lots of revolution. And you sort of come back. And I found I was in a position where I was trying to solve the same problems as I've been trying to solve 10 years ago. Yeah. And because of the way the technology had changed and it shifted from one way, but then it shifted back again. And I felt, you know, that, that, that I would, I'd come to the, the end of my time in, in, in IT. I didn't really want to, um, to go into management, mm -hmm. um, which would have been the next logical step. I, I tried management, hadn't really enjoyed it. And so I just felt it was time to do something else. And it, it was actually my wife that suggested photography. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was already kind of running photography as a bit of a side hustle anyway, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, but uh, the story goes that my, my I used to work in Scotland 
I was uh, Sky based in Scotland and I live in Cumbria in the Lake District. And so I would actually be away from home most of the time. Uh, I would leave home on a Monday morning and then I would stay in Scotland until Thursday evening and I would come home. I'd work from home on a Friday and then I'd be at home. So I was away from home a lot. Um, and that was the life that we chose. And we went on a holiday in early 2019. We were in Cuba and we'd gone away for two weeks and we were sitting there having drinks one night, uh, one evening after dinner. And my wife just kind of casually mentioned to me, she said, you know, this is the first time that we've been, we've had two weeks together in four years. And that kind of, that, so that little seed, it was, we sort of dismissed it at the time, but that seed just sort of stayed there. And um, I, you know, we, we came back from holiday and we went back to work, but that, that thought just stayed in our, in our minds. And to one point, Helen just said to me, you know, I think it is time for you to start thinking about basing yourself full time in Cumbria. And it's very difficult to go from such a senior position uh, as a, in a job I absolutely loved. I mean, to be a techie and to be able to do R&D and play with new technology, it's like a kid's dream, you know, and if you, if you really enjoy technology. To, to do that and then maybe to try and stay in IT and maybe go to, you know, some of the companies that are based in Cumbria, which, you know, it's not the same as in the London or in Edinburgh where I been working before yeah. you know it would it was uh, it would have been a, a, a i don't mean this in a bad way but it would have been a, in my eyes a step down mm. a step backwards um and i said well what am i going to do if i'd stopped working in in, in edinburgh in scotland what am i going to do and it was her that suggested why don't you give the photography a go and i didn't need asking twice <laughs> so we have Mrs. Sale to thank for your uh, your transition. In that it was sense. her idea, and I do remind her that on a regular basis. When well, she's I was going to say, you've got an opportunity to blame somebody there without any comeback on yourself, isn't it? Absolutely, like yeah. The dream it's all your situation. Fault, <laughs> I mean, what, one of the things I imagine a lot of people listening, you know, thinking, oh, it's all very, very well and good to kind of be a landscape photographer. But, you know, for some people, they feel that that is just not possible for one reason and another. And I suppose one of those reasons, um, you know, we were just mentioning kind of before we came on air is a lot of people say, I don't have the time, you know, I don't think my pictures are good enough or where do I start making money from this? There's, there's always feels like there's a lot of hurdles in a sense. Um, I mean, did you, did you have those hurdles in front of you? Did you look at it and go, my images aren't good enough for that? Or I don't know how to make any money out, out of landscape photography? When it, when it came to sort of going professional, I st uh, you know, and, and I, I, I stand by this now, um, is that the time when I made the decision, I was not as good a landscape photographer as I thought I was. A big, a big part of the decision to do it was to give me time to become the photographer that I thought I had the potential to be. And, and I'm, I'm definitely a long way down or much further down that road than I was. Um, but I think, um, that there's a certain level of naivety. And I think that that's a kind of strength of mine is that I've made some big decisions in my life, not fully understanding what the, the implications are. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but having that innate ability to respond to the problems as they, as they come along. So that's really important. Yeah, I, I I quite like that in a in a sense that you don't not say you don't have any fear and it, you just maybe not have any knowledge of of what the future holds really, but you're kind of quite willing to you know, not say go in blindly, but you're just quite willing to kind of go with the flow of it all really, and it yeah, it's paid I, off. I think it's a it's a, it's something that comes with age. Right? With age comes a certain degree of confidence, mm. and I do not think that I could have done what I did in my twenties. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, if you, if, yeah, if, that's a good thing, you know, if you went back, how old, 10 years, 20 years? <laughs> I wish. 20 <laughs> 20 yeah, years. If, if you went back that, that far now, um, you know, would you, would you consider going into landscape photography or do you think it's something that you, you need to have a little bit of life experience? Is that the right phrase? I think it really helps. Yeah. I do think it really, really helps. I think that there are people that can take landscape photography uh, as a job right out of college or or even even school mm. uh, university whatever it might be um but i do feel that they're in the minority and there is something to be said 
for uh, a certain level of maturity within landscape photography. I would sometimes or perhaps rather unkindly refer to it as an old man's sport, but um, you know there is a there is no denying that that it's largely an older generation. Uh, of people and certainly you see that in my client base and and my subscribers on youtube because we get all the analytics of course you know we can see (laughs) what sort of demographic we have and my audience is i'm so i'm 46 47 this late this month (laughs) um and i uh, my audience is predominantly older than i am yeah and predominantly male um so therefore uh, an old man sport but you know from a from a business point of view you know, you do you do need that sort of entrepreneurial flair and a little bit of experience, I think, yeah. to a certain extent. Although, perhaps social media is making a mockery of that to a certain extent. In that, there are some very, very, very clued up young people who are very, very good at mm-hmm. um, using social media to their advantage and, and to get getting um, attention on social media, and that in this game is half the battle. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you're right. I think there is some very good marketers out there. Mm-hmm. Does that translate to them being a good photographer? I suppose it's a different conversation or another conversation, but but, but yeah, you know, you're right. I, you know, without kind of generalizing or you know, spe- being too speculative about landscape photography, when I'm out and about with my camera, a, a large proportion of the people that I see out, what I would imagine, you know, taking landscape photographs, are kind of older, uh, you know, more senior uh, guys, you know, and they've they've got DSLR and they've got all the kit and caboodle, et cetera. Um, Not to say it's exclusively, you know, fitted for that kind of um, that demographic, et cetera, as well. But I would agree that's a lot of what I see in there. Um, It'd be lovely to see more, more, more women, um, you know, whether that's just, you know, I'm not going the right places on night time, etc. as well. But I mean, do you, do you see, do you teach um, a lot of women into landscape photography? Yeah, I mean, I'm very, I'm very lucky um, to have a number of female clients. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy working with them very much. It is very different. I don't want to sound kind of sexist, but it, it is very different from working with guys mm-hmm. i think that to us to a large extent one of the things that i've noticed is that guys are very much interested in cameras and gear mm-hmm. and uh, i i find uh, that the that, that, that female photographers have less of an interest in that and they're actually a lot more interested in um you know capturing the beauty and and, and that that kind of thing yeah um so that's that was a, a distinction that, that i would make and i am seeing more and more ladies come into landscape photography and younger and younger ladies coming in coming into uh, landscape photography which i think is great yeah that's really, really positive because yeah. yeah we 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 have a lot on eye photography a lot of female photographers um taking up our courses and using the gallery etc uh, and for the ones i know a little bit better on our eye photography plus platform um i i do i agree with you that the ladies they tend to have um the more say tuned in that they, they concentrate a lot more on the subject matter of, of the narrative of the image mm-hmm. and for me that that's what i kind of that's how I see my photography or at least how I approach photography. I honestly talking about cameras, tripods, lenses, bores the living crap out of me. <laughs> uh, really me. Does. You know, we, we, every now and again, you know, I, I resist so much that we don't do like a uh, you know camera reviews or, or tech reviews, et cetera. So, Cause I would just be like, yeah, it, it's a lens. It does this. I know what it does. You know, it, it, yeah. it's all about the, the, in, the good thing about a photograph is what is in it. You know, it, it, yeah, it's yeah, that's very degree. true. If you've got a, you know, a, an iPhone, you know, sometimes they can kind of capture some decent images on that if you know what you're doing with it. Yeah. But it's what's in front of you. And I find that certainly, uh, you know, a lot of ladies know what they're doing there and, and a lot of guys as well. But, of but it's, not, it's not just gear. I think it's more, I think that's perhaps a little unfair, but it's more about the technique. Hmm. And I think that, I think that, you know, Guys are a lot more interested in making sure the images are pin sharp yeah. and and perhaps well composed. Whereas I see in female photographers um, a, a greater willingness to share things like emotion. Yeah, and I think that that 
again, without wanting to put a, put a broad sweep of, of, a, of a brush through the sexes, is per perhaps because female photographers are a little more in, in touch with their emotions and their feelings yeah. than, than us blokes. I mean, I am a pretty straightforward British bloke. I, uh, aside from photography, I like rugby and I like beer and I like pies <laughs> and that's about it really. And so when it comes to trying to fit emotion um, into our photography, that is something that I find harder than you know some other people uh, mm. because I'm perhaps not as in tune with my emotions as as they are. I, I think that's probably where I would be different to you. I think I am a lot more feminine um, in just my artistic view things. So uh -huh. you know, you know I, I I look at an image and okay, it may not be compositionally perfect and i mm. think that's maybe potentially a lot of guys they do have a lot the barometer of a good image is more technically based as opposed yeah. to emotionally based as you say maybe like with ladies um but yeah i certainly kind of fall down that route a little bit um that you know i look at an image and do i what do i feel about it is it kind of emotionally compelling if so you know i probably like that more than if it was super sharp and in focus but maybe didn't have as much of a, of a great story behind it really but yeah. um yeah. Ha have you noticed the size of the tangent that we've gone on here it's a big tangent i was looking at my question thinking back in. what question did we start on here that I've, <laughs> I've gone off so much really but bringing ourselves back onto air um and going back about um about the work-life balance etc i mean that, that is still very very important anyway but um but obviously giving up the the nine to five life as you did and you know, the secure income that that comes with etc you know obviously takes a lot of guts really because when you, you not, you're going into it it's like going into a new job but you don't know when you're going to get paid if you're going to get paid you know for some people it's probably well for everybody i would say it's a wise thing to be doing it incrementally so you don't just like we said before you don't just wake up and decide to be a landscape photographer one day as well but you know do you think it's worthwhile people having you know a decent amount of savings behind themselves first or i mean did you consider or did you kind of have clients before you went full-time in landscape photography um no so i didn't have a single paying client before i went full-time what, what I, was the I, madness that drove you into doing this without having any kind of any backup there i i i so i mean i, I was we, i was relatively financially secure um, so, you know, I had a corporate IT job for, for, for 20 years, yeah. um, you know, I, with that comes a certain amount of, uh, fiscal reward. <laughs> um, and so we had, um, we were able to, so we, we prepared for this. So I didn't just make the decision and then have my notice in, I made my decision. And then there was a period where we prepared ourselves for that. Um, and actually, that that journey started really, I guess, back in uh, 2007. So I went full time in 2019. Mm -hmm. But the journey started the year after I got married. And that involved us sort of sort of relocating from the south up to, to here to be close to the Lake District. Never really so much with a, with a view to going full time, but we, we knew that you know, we wanted to do that. I mean, it's obviously cheaper to live up here than it is down south. My mortgage is significantly lower up here than it was down there. And so we started to do that and we started to make significant changes in our lifestyle. So when I used to work, I used to work in Canary Wharf, you know, and I used to work on, on kind of big um, trading platforms, you know, so I was working in the financial center, uh, albeit in IT. Um, you know, we had... Well, maybe not an extravagant lifestyle, but we had a big house and I drove, I had a new car and I, drove, I had a fast car, a sports car, and we would go on a holiday to, to exotic places. And, you know, that was great. But um, I think one of the things that we became very aware of very quickly was that none of that was making us happy. And so we set off on this, this journey um, to, to, to find you know find happiness elsewhere and photography was was not really a part of that but certainly being living up here you know that was uh, so yeah so to, to cut a long story short uh we had some savings i had a property 
in Scotland, which is where I was living during the week, um, which we sold. And so there was a significant amount of money backing us um, so that we could continue to afford. To, and I think I, I think I actually had two years worth of, you know, I could afford to pay the mortgage and I could afford to feed us and I could afford to pay all the bills for two years if I never earned a penny. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was important. I mean, for, for people, though, that um, maybe aren't in those positions, how do you think they could begin to maybe make some money as a, as a side hustle, let's call it as well? Because obviously, you know, time is a very demanding thing as well. You've still got to do your job and you've still got to do that mm. well, et cetera. But then fitting it, you know, in your, your hobby, which you hopefully want to turn into a job further down the line, yeah. alongside all your other family demands, et cetera, you know, if, you, if you've got those other demands in your life. But I um, where would you where would you say if you if you were kind of going into this kind of more incrementally and you're doing like side jobs etc what kind of things could you recommend somebody to do how how they could make money i think i think specifically within landscape photography i do feel that the semi-professional sector for want of a better word um is a significant proportion of that Mm-hmm. And I do think that there are a lot of good landscape photographers who have normal nine to five jobs, but then they also have uh, an additional income through landscape photography. And that will be, tradi- that will be through traditional income streams, uh, mostly. So they will run workshops, um, you know, and they will, you know, during their vacation, their holiday from their nine to five job, they may go to, uh, Norway and run a group, you know, out there, and um, and they may sell prints and they yeah. may sell calendars, books, or, or what have you, um, and that that sort of thing. And, you, and so, I do think that that's a, that's a very very distinct possibility. It's very um, for, in in landscape, um, but there's also I and mean, there are becoming increasingly more. Uh, avenues or, or income streams that, that other people can tap into so youtube uh there is always potential there to make money through through making videos and it's very very hard and you don't make an awful lot of money unless you start to grow a bigger channel but you know there are uh, i can think of you know quite a few uh, photographers who've made their name on youtube who you know, started off as amateurs who had another job. In fact, I suspect if you looked at the top 20 YouTube photographers or, or you know, photographers that, that have made their name on YouTube, that at least half of them had another job when they started. Their, you know, they might have been in photography. So obviously I suspect... Um, if most people will, that, that are listening to this will probably know of Thomas Heaton. Um, you know, arguably the most well-known um, photographer, landscape photographer of his generation, purely through his um, the attention that he's got through YouTube. But Thomas wasn't a landscape professional landscape photographer when he started his YouTube channel. He had a photography business. I think he was doing product photography, and he had media training and that kind of thing. I think he worked a, a bit as a, as a camera man. Um, yeah. But, you know, he did it. And, you know, some of the other guys, when well, Nigel Danson ran his own business and was running his own business in, in California and in San Francisco before he became mm-hmm. a professional landscape photographer. Adam Karnak, um, who runs First Man Photography, he was a policeman before he became a professional photographer. I can see him you being know. a policeman now, yeah. I think he's, <laughs> he's got great, quite, a, quite a commanding presence, he does. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't, I've never met him, but I, I, I wouldn't mess with him. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for, for yourself, though, you know, because obviously going and keeping in that 2007, 2008 time period when you were starting to make those plans, you know, if you're running your, your corporate life and your photography kind of side by side, how did you, especially given that it was a very, very demanding job, how did you fit it into your routine? Did you have to like write down schedules or plans as to when you were working, when you had time? How did you actually kind of balance the two in, in the window of time that you had? So the, the most important thing was that I was with, with my wife, Helen. Um, we were able to identify when there was time for me to do it and when there was not time. Mm. Um, and bearing in mind that I was away most of the week and which so we were apart, um, 
I um, negotiated. <laughs> <That's> a very <laughs> is, is the best way of putting it. I negotiated. <laughs> I, I got Saturday mornings. Yeah. So I was allowed to go out and shoot her loud. <laughs> we agreed that that would be when Ellen's I Ellen's a lovely agree. lady, by the way. Just she's made sound like she's some sort she's of kidnapper. She's not an old <laughs> not at all. But she, we, we kind of agreed that that's when I would do it. And um, that really, really helped us. Uh, it really helped me um, from, a, from a kind of photographic point of view because it meant that that was when I shot. So if we didn't have perfect conditions, I still went out. If it was raining, I still went out. If it was cloudy, I still went out. If it was clear skies, I still went out. And it helped me to learn to cope with different situations and, and to, to adjust my photography accordingly. But for, for Helen, what that meant was that um, she knew that that time was sacred. And um, she, that allowed her to go and do whatever she wanted to do at that time. And then we would come back together again around lunchtime uh, on, on a Saturday. And then we, we would have the rest of the weekend together. Um, That's good. So that was that was really good. And then because I was away, uh, I had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights uh, yeah. on my own. And that's when that that time was then put a set aside for my YouTube work. So um, I would typically go out on a Saturday morning. I would shoot. I would film for my YouTube channel, and then I would go back to um, work. And then Monday night. I would edit and my video typically a week ahead. Tuesday, my video would be released. Mm -hmm. And so I would then spend Tuesday night responding to comments as they came in. And then Wednesday evening, replying to comments as they came in and then planning the video for the next week. And so I, all of the YouTube stuff, as, as much as it was possible, and there were times I did sort of stray outside of that, but that was taken care of it on those, those three nights. That's really good. I mean, it, it's good that you had a schedule. I mean, it, it kind of answers a little bit like my next question, because I was going to ask you, you know, given the changes that, you know, you had to adapt, did it upset anybody in the family? Did it, did it ever kind of upset Helen, et cetera? But it sounds like through your open conversation and communication with her, that the two of you managed to get to a, you know, an agreement, a negotiation. <laughs> yeah. You're happy it, how much time you were having away from each other. Yeah. I mean, so... I think Helen, was, to a certain extent, was very pleased I was doing the photography side of things because it was nice that I had something other than work. And, you know, it was such a, such a good way of dealing with stress for me. <laughs> this wasn't necessarily the case when the YouTube thing came in as well because that's incredibly stressful. Yeah. Trying to film yourself and you take photographs and you know you've only ever got half your mind on the photography and then there's of course that the, we won't go into the kind of the the, the, the negatives of being on youtube mm -hmm. um but it, she, she's very supportive of that but i think definitely having that time when it was like well this is when i do that um and then i you know saying that you know you've then got the rest of my time and and, and you have my undivided attention yeah and um, that definitely helped i think it's i think it can be very difficult for as a landscape photographer, I think it can be very, very difficult for our partners if we are constantly disappearing at the drop of a hat because the sky looks good. Um, and that's that has that ha that discipline and that that respect for my marriage, which is a, above all the most important thing in my life, far more important than the Lake District, far more important than photography. That is protected, and the photography fits around it. And that you remains. Not be as listening, I said, you know, Chris. She and you said the most wonderful romantic thing, but I don't. Know no, 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 listening. no. She knows all this. She knows all this. She knows I'm sorry. But, Carry um, on. Um, it stayed with us today. So I don't shoot in the evenings. I only shoot in the mornings. Part of that is because I am a morning person and that's when I do my best work but it's also partly because that fits in with our life um part of the great lifestyle difference between what I did before and what I'm doing now is that I'm home more yeah. and I can spend the time with Helen and we do spend time together in the evenings now that, that we missed out on and and you know that becomes a, a big part of it and so again it's having those boundaries yeah. Being a professional and working as hard as I do, those boundaries are getting blurred. And I do work some evenings and I do work a lot of weekends. Mm -hmm. So Saturday mornings still aside for photography, but it's mostly workshops. Yeah. Um, you know, so 
Yeah, I just say I think it's it's nice that you've involved her in, in in such a way, and I think that's something that anybody listening is probably a good kind of tip to take away that you know involving your your family, communicating, telling them what you're doing, and you know almost effectively giving them a schedule ahead of time to say this is you know what I'd like to do if that works around family life because obviously if people have got um, yeah. children, if they've got pets, they've got to walk, dogs they've got to take out, etc. You've got to fit all those things in. Mm. So it's important for, that you you have that time to do your photography, but also you don't ne- negate all the jobs that you have to do as part of you know being a a mother or a father or whatever it may be within yeah. the family itself but have you ever involved Helen in the photography itself does she ever go out with you with the camera no she does <laughs> we've tried it <laughs> bless her she has very many good points but patience is not one of them she's not one for <laughs> standing around waiting for the for the light to happen uh, <laughs> She, she sort of elbows me out of the way, gets her, gets her phone, and click, right, we're done, let's go. Um, Is it, isn't that what landscape photography... No, no, am I no, not, 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 not. <laughs> no, So that right? photography involves an awful lot standing around, <laughs> yes. waiting oh, for I something agree. to happen. <laughs> um, that's certainly the way I do it. So she, she's, and sometimes she's not, it never yeah. happens as well. You know, that, yeah. that's the way it goes. But no, it, Exactly, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't. Sometimes it never happens at all. But, uh, you know, she's... I, I, I do like to... I've always tried to keep my professional and my personal life separate. And I don't see that as needing to be different now that I'm self-employed and I work for myself. So we do, and she does get involved in the business. She's, she's involved in the business behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So Helen has a, um, Helen has a, a background in logistics. She, she's a gardener now, but she, she used to be an event manager. Um, and so she's involved in a lot of the running of the business and she does an awful lot of work with, with hotels. And, you know, when we've got clients coming up to stay and uh, she manages all sorts of kind of, bits and bobs for me, like shipping of my zines and that kind of thing. So That's she's brilliant. sort of involved, but uh, no, I never take her out on, on location. She can be a bit of a distraction. <laughs> but it's not, it's nice either way that, you know, it is a, you know, a partnership, a collaboration in parts really, which is great. I think it um, needs to be. Yeah. I, I mean, to, to summarize them, if, you know, so if we give ourselves the opportunity to wrap this up kind of quite nicely. Could you give a couple of tips on, you know, for anyone's listening, how best to balance that work in photography so it's enjoyable and it's it's something to look forward to? Is there, you know, two or three little tidbits um, about kind of how to organise their life or little things that they could consider based upon what we've, I suppose, little things that we've talked about? So. I, I I do think it's really those those kind of two points two points that we we've, we've touched upon. Um, uh, the first one is to is to make time and set aside time to do your photography. And, and, I, and for me, it really worked that that was a consistent time, uh, day of the week or a morning of the week. Um, so I think that that's really, really, really important. Um, and I also think that just, you know, making sure that if you do that and that you, if you, you have that luxury of being able to dedicate you know, not an insignificant amount of time we're talking here as well. We're talking about, a, you know, a quarter of the weekend almost mm. uh, to a certain extent. Um, yes, yeah, so it's not an insignificant chunk. So I think if you are going to do that, then I do think it's very, very important then that photography doesn't compromise time with your family. So that you, and so that, you know, it's like, it's like life. It's like with anything, you know, if you really, really want to be successful, in your in your marriage or in your family life you have to dedicate time to it and you need to keep the distractions out so if you can find time for your photography and then make sure that your photography doesn't spill out into your family life i think that's probably the way to go excellent lovely and you just reminded me where we were just saying at the very end i know on i photography we've got a blog about making time for your photography they're just little summaries little tips um not so specifically for, for landscape photography but obviously you know a lot of what chris has talked about is perfect for that but if you go to iphotography.com forward slash blog um and if you search for making time i think that's probably the best phrase you should be able to kind of find a tutorial that just gives you a little bit of information about kind of how to distribute your time and create planners just so you can kind of get the most out of your photography without negating uh, all your other duties in life really but um but thanks for that chris that's been a really really good little show it's been lovely to to kind of get an understanding because i think it's a it's an important thing a lot of people will want to know because i feel that there is a lot of people that would just believe that they have no time in their lives and while they may that may feel true you know with having a job and and children and all the other kind of duties there is always 
the opportunity somewhere, isn't there? It, it doesn't mm-hmm. need to take hours. I know you said, you know, a quarter of your weekend has taken up, but landscape photography doesn't necessarily need such a demand, does it? No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't, no. And there are many, many different approaches to it. And you obviously, you know, you did, did ask if, if Helen was involved and, and typically she's not. But then, you know, we, we, we do still do a lot of walking together. And of course, that's an opportunity to take a photo, a photographs. Um, not maybe necessarily at sunrise she doesn't like sunrise <laughs> um, but you know that kind of thing and of course we've all got phones these days with cameras on them and so we can typically steal half an hour even if it's in a lunch break to mm. to take a walk out of the office and to and to indulge in photography so it doesn't have yeah. to be as regimented or as as strict as as, as the way that I went yeah, indeed, indeed, that's brilliant. And if you want to catch uh, a little bit more um, about Chris, then you'll find him on YouTube. And you'll find him on Instagram. It's Chris Sale, S A L E. I'm going to keep saying that now in yep. case anybody stops taking you in as like a boat sale, yep. um, or as you said in the other episode, the jumble sale. Jumble sale. <laughs> jumble was my nickname at school. Yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously you can kind of catch. Um, our other episodes uh, about landscape photography with Chris previously, and we've still got more to come. So keep looking out for them. If you want to get in touch with ourselves at iPhotography, you can do. You can email us with tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com. Um, but otherwise, we'll leave it there for now, and we're going to move on, uh, and you can kind of catch another show. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you again to Chris, and we'll see you in the next show. <laughs>